Good morning. Good morning, Vietnam. Welcome to another Monday. Yes, sir. Oh, it was so fun getting together with you. Right on. Yeah, that was a very nice Saturday. Really missed hanging out in person. It's coming back. <laughs> yeah, that's what I hear. <laughs> hanging out in person is coming back. It's not overrated. No, it isn't. I have a very important question for you. Uh oh. <laughs> 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 who wrote clay pigeons i don't know i'd have to look it up no really do you want me to look it up is it important that i look it up no it wouldn't be a podcast without me tapping on my keyboard in the background who wrote um um you know that song of oh shoot the woman and she you know she's saying like You'd think, you know, she's talking about her husband. I think it's her husband. And like, they have nothing to say. And she's saying like, he comes home after this full day. You'd think there'd be something to talk about. Shoot, I, I keep mixing it up. It's like Sunday morning, but I keep, that's the Chris Christopherson song, Sunday morning coming down. Okay. Uh, did you see that movie with that girl who would pretend she's drunk? and dudes would pick her up and oh yeah we talked about this okay the movie ends with this song what song damn it i Did don't you, know you, but you were bringing it up for a reason though uh, i don't have reasons for my madness <laughs> dang it <laughs> all right oh that's so funny because one thought i had this morning is i thought we could use a producer and i was going to bring that up with you like i think if we had a producer it would help us a lot just someone that's sort of bird's eye view and help us like hey this and that this and that what do you think of that idea i'm open to it i mean we still haven't made any money for our charities so that's more important to me well, there's the potential if a producer comes in that. Um, yeah, know, I see the value of it us. for sure. I totally see the value of it. And it'd be, you know, one other person we can torture. Well, they won't necessarily have to appear. Yeah, they wouldn't. They would just. Yeah, exactly. They'd be, they'd be a, a hidden, behind the like, scenes producer. Right. Right. Then we'd need more equipment. And it sounds like fun. Sounds like we're heading in the right podcasting direction. I just a lot of the shows I respect have producers and from what I've sort of read between the lines, they're a valuable aspect to input to helping move a podcast to yeah. the next level. Yeah, I, I agree. And the idea of having a plan, a little bit of a plan before we get here, that that's really helpful. Like, <laughs> You know, I've written down some notes. <laughs> yeah, there's that, and then you know, I I brought something to the table today that I'm hoping to use sparingly. Ah! <laughs> well, you've got a lot of cheese. <laughs> that was a lot. gas. Got gas. There's something. I think gas. Like now with Jonah and his friends, that's like getting high. Got gas. Is that how they what they call it now? Let's get gas. Yeah, gassed. There's a Cat Stevens song called Ban Apple Gas, which is kind of like that. It's really killer. Huh. Ban Apple, Ban Apple Gas, Ban Apple Gas. All the world is sniffing on Ban Apple Gas. He's so funny because there's another song that he has, and I can't remember it, but I remember when the kids were young, I came across it. It was almost like this kid's tune, really light and and silly like i'd never guess cat stevens to create such a song well there's this album that ban apple gas is on it's called numbers and it's super lighthearted. it's not like the sort of you know other stuff the harold and maude stuff and and, and broken hearted woe yeah, is the world <laughs> my dad and i you know i don't get along with my dad father and son all that stuff like that's all great like that's important yeah and it's really big part of his work but right. numbers 
it's it's such a great album on so many levels. One, I like the esoteric sort of hermetic sciences part of it because each of the songs relates to a number and there's all this math and all this cool stuff about it. Then the lightheartedness that some of the songs characters inhabit is cool. And then there's a heavy duty, you know, wizard type dude who's like very serious like me. <laughs> I like that guy. Are you a serious wizard? What is that? Yes. Oh. <laughs> that was an interesting sounding snare roll. It sounded like a machine. Yeah. It wasn't until the symbol came in that I realized what I was listening to. Yeah. It's, you know, dollar store style. <laughs> really? Do you have just this whole plethora of buttons at your disposal now? Oh, great. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> maybe I'll use them all before the show's over, and maybe I won't. <laughs> Let's see if you can compose a song with them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that. Quickly becoming useless. I actually like that one. I thought that was uh, uplifting. That was an upstroke for the Ohm community. <laughs> we haven't really talked about Ohm on this much, have we? No. Yeah. Should we? Do you think it'll scare people? Scare people. It does scare people. I have experienced that in life. It also um, triggers people with past trauma to, you know, engage, resurface, to deal with, you know, it's there's no place to hide in Ohm. <laughs> that reminds me of a BTO song. You don't have to hide. Have you heard Ooh, that I'm song? not familiar with that one. Uh, really good. BTO has some classic gems that no one's ever heard of. Yeah, have you heard Blown? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's another great one. <laughs> I was blown. Oh, right inside, right inside, right inside a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, it's about this hollowed out tree and this hike and ended very nicely. <laughs> Apparently. That was a happy ending. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that just reminds me of a very bad joke I saw on TikTok last night. Yeah. What's lawn and this, uh, this girl is saying it to her husband. What's lawn and a hard and full of semen? Well, I got lots of guesses, but why don't you tell me the joke? So she said, the shit I just had. <laughs> My God. Oh, Lord. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. notice i had to preface that with making sure that it was clear to the world she said it this isn't my words <laughs> i didn't have a long hard shit full of semen she did i was gonna say a ship but you know that would submarine be i think is the <clears throat> childhood answer i heard when i was hearing that joke in fact her husband said a submarine <laughs> at least someone's laughing <laughs> yep i'm almost out of buttons wow how many are left oh you'll just have to wait and see <laughs> back to oma <Omar. laughs> yeah it stands for orgasmic meditation there's a practice that was outlined in a book written by a woman named nicole de Don called slow sex and it centers the practice of meditation around um, physical contact between a man and a woman that is designed to, well, for both partners, it does a lot, but I think primarily it's designed for women to have more access to a greater sense of interconnection to their desire and to let down their center of vigilance, that thing that always has them sort of clamped down 
on their conditioned responses and to unleash the parts of them that are yearning to experience pleasure and to experience life in, in an empowered way, self-directed way. And, you know, that's just sort of the scratching the surface. Now, the practice is actually very sexual. So it's not, it's orgasmic meditation, right? It's not just sitting and with a mantra, right? So right. <clears throat> there's physical touch involved with the clitoris and the finger. Yeah. And it's very specific. It's sort of like the form to it is really important with something called the container. And uh, the container is 15 minutes long. It starts with a, um, a bell and then it ends with a bell. Um, doesn't end with a finger bang. Um, <laughs> ends with a bang, a finger bang. <laughs> Wah, wah. Anyway, you don't have that sound effect on your button. I might, but I just can't read it because the type is too small. <laughs> and you're afraid to push one. Maybe they would cheer. <laughs> I'm just, everyone's been so on target. I don't want to, you know, like misuse don't, this uh, toy. All right, go with, go with that. This is more. Use the force. So yeah, this practice is very liberating. It was really incredible for me um, to find this practice because it, was really challenging because the practice is a goalless practice. You, the stroker, usually a man, the temptation every time you sit down is to do it good, right? Which usually translates to creating some sort of response in the partner. And as soon as you're doing that, you're up in your head trying to do something. And the whole nature of the, pro, the practice is to break down all of that heady conditioning, all of that attachment to outcome, all of that trying to be good enough, you know, do it right, fix the stroke, all of these things that come up for strokers, very confronting, very, very confronting for me, especially. And also over time, really, really liberating, you know, because the way Ohm works as a 15 minute practice becomes a metaphor for how you can run your life. And so when Greg and I talk about upstrokes and downstrokes, there's kind of a vibe to that. An upstroke has a kind of like lifting you, kind of anticipatory building up. Kind building of energy, right. And then a downstroke has a kind of grounding, lowering the vibration, you know, sinking into the earth. Now, both of them have an orgasmic quality to them. They're both pleasure. Well, I've heard upstroke in ohm um, group as a reference to something that's a positive and a downstroke as something that's a negative. Yeah, and I think that's misapplied in, in those groups. I think well, that it's too easy to, again, what are we doing? We're making a, a kind of value judgment on right. something. And the whole practice is about entering into this understanding without our value judgments, just the experience, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the idea that a downstroke metaphor in conversation could mean something that's a bummer or something that's kind of taking us into a, a less elevated experience. I get why, but at the same time, there's all this really pleasant, amazing nutrition from a grounded experience, having a, a con, an earthy connection. So to me, I don't see the, the, them that way. I try to stay as value neutral as possible throughout my metaphors. And then also <laughs> when, whenever I'm stroking a clitor clitoris, yeah, we should. I think we should. I think it's healthy to say it was primarily a man and a woman, but obviously with everyone's sexual preferences, there's women, women and men, men, though men, men, I think is less prevalent. That's not Ohm. Well, I think women, women is. Yes, I agree. Men, men is something else. It's right. Not striking but forward. you know, you could still have the aspects of a container. And I do love that you're bringing mindfulness to the most charged human element sexuality, I can't think of anything more charged than that. And intimate, like what a great place for mindfulness. And, and people so shy away from it. It's just so as you said earlier, there's a triggering element that people well, run from. Well, you have you can run from it, 
or you can run towards it and move through it. Like that's what's so beautiful about the practice practice of OM is that you can deepen into your aversions and your triggers. And if you're held properly by your community and by the, the container, then there's an, a, an opportunity to feel that stuff and break down the conditioning that goes with it and reprogram your subconscious to recognize pleasure in place of fear. I would also right. mention that <clears throat> the OM practice as created by Nicole and this other gentleman, I understand they were the primary creators, founders, and they created a business from it. And like all the businesses I'm aware of, going back to Est and my personal experience, it seems like business always brings a dram dramatic story. There's a dramatic ending, you know, and people have, you know, people feel like they were taken, other people are running to the, um, to support the person. In fact, um, I was at a, a party recently and there was a woman there that was involved with the community back east that you and I saw that documentary. Um, oh, yeah. And she had a very positive experience and she acknowledged there were some human elements to this gentleman and like, yeah, he probably wasn't on point with this thing that he did. But overall, her life was transformed for the better. And again, like people love drama. And I think people get so caught up in creating a, dra a drama from something. Well, I and think we should clarify that, uh, that uh, Nicole adapted this practice from another group that she was part of, which was called The Warehouse. And they had a whole different sort of framework that they did. So she didn't really invent the thing. And then she oh, created- I thought the warehouse came out of Ohm. No, it's the other way around. Ah. And she adapted what they were doing there, which was a lot of experimentation. And, you know, I think what she did with it had value. And quickly we start telling the story of the the- community and the experience and the business and what that meant and all those things. And that really, like, that's an important story for people who who were part of their <laughs> original organization. But what I really like to zero in on is the liberating quality of the practice itself. Right. The idea that when you take, when you strip away all of the human chaos that goes with our conditioning and our contexts and our lives and our judgments and all of these things, there's this really vulnerable moment that two people can share. And typically when we do it in the sense of we're having sex, then there's all of this, these things that we do around the dating ritual and the sexual ritual and performance and what's in or and all of that. But what, what's great about Ohm is it's free from all of that, that dating context. So the idea of having a 15 minute pleasurable experience, no strings attached without a goal has a lot of merit in and of itself. And there's a form, like it's very specific. You sit down at a specific time, you do a certain thing at a specific time, then like the, it's like the Japanese tea ceremony of sexual contact. Exactly, yes. Yeah. And uh, I think for, as a male, as a male identifier, male, <laughs> he, uh, there's things learn to hear no and not take it as a personal blow to you know i'm not put down from someone saying no to me and in part what was healthy also is to learn that that was that moment and the next moment the answer may be yes yeah because there's this ritual of asking <clears throat> to a partner if they want to have an ohm and yes or no is a perfectly acceptable answer. And so one of the great things that men get from this is the idea of being clear on what their desires are in a way that's not um, full of a lot of the traditional toxic things that we've been talking about in culture, like pressure and 
and kind of misogyny and commerce where I do this and you do that and all of these things. So as someone who's male myself, and then when you ask if someone wants to share an ohm or have an ohm with you, you learn how to ask for what you want in a very direct, clear way that's based on your true desire. And you practice asking for it free from all of the other attachments that go with that, what it means about you if they say yes or no, and you know, all of those things. And so what you do with that is then you, when you translate that into real life and you actually have a desire for something and you learn to ask for what you need or ask for what you want in a way that's value neutral and not attached to the yes or no, there's this whole doorway to freedom that opens up in intimate relationships, whether that's friendships or, you know, partnerships uh, of a romantic sexual nature. So yeah, it was truly liberating to me. And, you know, before Ohm for me, I was kind of stuck in the nice guy mode. And I spent a lot of time in the friend zone. And so <laughs> getting the I mean, I was married for 21 years, and I was in the friend zone for part of that. I mean, it was like, it was weird. But um, my drama aside, <laughs> The Nicely thing is, done. The thing is, <laughs> when I got permission to really be in my desires fully without apology to myself, and then I was able to calibrate my communication around them so that it wasn't about my value if someone said yes or no, all of a sudden people were free to say yes or no based on their desire. And so now the experience of receiving my requests or being involved with me in a um, you know, a situation where I'm initiating things that might be pleasurable, got to be a lot better. And my dating life took off because I, all my conditioning and all my past trauma wasn't wrapped up in my desire anymore. And, you know, that's just one slice. That's just like one little tiny benefit <laughs> of this practice. Now, I also was super challenged by it like there's it's still really um nerve wracking i think is a great term because the whole idea is to enter into a field of practice with two nervous systems and try to to harmonize with yourself i.e meditation right and so the, the lead up to that and going through all the things that your mind goes through when you're getting ready to sit down and stroke a clit and like when you're stroking a clit you're like you can't help but go, well, I'm not doing it right. Or why isn't she moaning? Or like, there's just a million opportunities. Want to get her off <laughs> your own ego. Yeah. Right. And so it's weird because the sexual context gives us all of these kinds of frameworks that we bring into the, the, the container, the nest. Yeah. And then one by one, the more you practice, the more you liberate yourself from all of that conditioning in your life the more sensation that's available to you and the more spaciousness of what that experience can actually be. And, you know, you can't actually have the goal of this in your own practice. But one of the results I experienced was sex totally changed for me when I started when I was able to have sex, you know, from a different place than I was coming from. It was way better for me and way better for my partners. And Nicole's book is slow sex, right? So that's a real clue to just, just slow down, everybody. Just do slow down. Yeah. And I think even um, when not slow, the, like that's okay. You know, instead of rushing to something, it happens from a natural place and all the passion that one has in one's body can be fully experienced. And what I've numerous, this keeps coming up for me. One of the greatest things I learned from the practice was being responsible for what I feel, even when it's a positive. Like if I say to a woman, you know, I really like your hair. You look beautiful today. And she goes, thank you. And I may be left with this sort of rush of like giddiness and, oh, I want to do something with this. It's not her responsibility. It's for me to just chill with. It's, yeah. it's not something to animalistically act upon and pounce on. And even the opposite, if I'm feeling like I say, hey, you look beautiful and I don't get a response and I'm left unnerved, not her problem. 
are his problem. You know, it's for me. Well, this is where way. we start. This is where we start to get into some of the contexts that are really relevant today, because the male gaze and the idea that somehow we get to say you're beautiful as if that matters to a woman, it's kind of um, it's a low level form of aggression. Because it doesn't have to be. It doesn't really... have to be. But generally speaking, it's not for us to comment on some how someone looks. That's not necessarily the best way to relate to people. Well, see, like, here's hello what, is a much better start. I think, like, if I say, Mark, you look really handsome today. That's just a compliment. And here's the key thing, though. If I have an expectation linked to that, now it's no longer just a friendly, you look beautiful, you look handsome. Now I have my own unspoken goals or um, manipulations in a way. And I think part of what Ohm practice is it brings those right in sight. And now I can go, oh, I can let go of that. And now when I say you look beautiful, that's it. It may piss her off. Who cares? It, it was just a friendly thing. And what happens is I'm, I'm unattached to that. Well, I think there's a subtlety here that I want to call out. Because okay. I care how she feels about what I say, because I'm responsible for how my communication lands. And like I said before, my the context of my male gaze in terms of whether that means that she is or isn't beautiful is an ego trip. Yeah, but I would say that you thinking that you had any responsibility for her reaction is also male ego. Okay, well, I think there's some, there's a subtlety there that is I'm willing to parse with you. But to say I'm not responsible at all is also not true. No, it is true. No, it's not. It is true. You can't be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't be 100% responsible, except for this. It either is or it isn't. We are responsible for our emotions and ourself. We are responsible. So someone may say to me, hey, Greg, have a nice day. And I'm like, oh, cool. And another person goes, hey, Greg, have a nice day. And I'm like, oh, wow. Sarcastic much? Like, you know, fuck you. Neither of those people are responsible for my reaction. I'm responsible for it. Okay. Now, well, I understand what you're saying, that you have empathy for how people feel. No, you're, However, you're missing the point. You're missing nope, the point. Nope, you're missing the point. Okay. Let, now, people, you're going to hear us for 20 minutes go back and forth say, no, you're missing the point. No, you're missing the point. Okay, your turn. No, you're missing the point. All right, here's why I think the words you used matter. Because value neutral communication is, is the practice. So if we're extending the practice of OM into real life, the idea that you're going to say you look beautiful has a, a value judgment in it. For, you've created that value judgment. And the other person's created that value judgment. They're, they're, words are only words. And we give value and meaning to them, which is why many people on this planet can use the N word freely and friendly, and they're very at ease with it. And I'm not. Let's try not to change the subject to the N word. No, <laughs> I'm just There's saying. A theory. If you say you look shitty today, are they responsible for their feelings? Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. And were you kind? I would say no. Okay. personally, but that's my personal. What I'm getting at is it's possible to say you look beautiful today and for it to land unkind to them, despite your intention. Exactly. And it's, and it male, wasn't your it's male privilege that has us believe that it's okay for us to start with that. I love how this has gone like this. Now, this is a downstroke. <laughs> <laughs> we've gotten very serious which is part of what we do here at moped outlaws yes 
Um, and then we turn it into an upstroke. The, the idea of levity must come in. So, yeah, I don't think we actually disagree that much. We're both trying to make nuanced points about how subtle life is and how a little bit of a difference can mean a lot. And I think that's true. I think from, if you know, like for a moment, if we switched roles in this debate, we could each argue the other point fairly well. Well, now, okay, so here's something else that is in the own practice, safe porting, and I appreciate that. And people that I know personally, I know if I'm going to touch upon a topic, there's a, like an intuitive sense, oh, this could be a hot button, this might be explosive. And so I can safe port and I could say, hey, I've got this thing that might be volatile, or is it okay to share it? And then that person can say no, and good, I'm not going to. Or they could say yes, and now they've been forewarned. And um, there's even in our own communication on WhatsApp, I remember recently, like I had this really crude poem came to mind in answer to one of the prompts, daily prompts. And I said, you know, what just came to mind kind of calls for safe porting is, it a, you know, should I continue? And someone wrote, sure, continue. So I wrote it. And then she thanked me and she said, thank you. And safe porting really helped me with that. So that's, I think, where our empathy and knowing someone helps to, to keep volatile drama to a minimum. Well, now we're talking about layers of intimacy, like when you have a connection with someone already and you have a relationship with them, there's an, an unspoken sort of openness, a permissiveness that exists that's different than if you just cold, like cold walk into a situation and comment on someone's appearance. So I think that matters in how, how this discussion framework works, right? Like, and the, I like the, like safe porting is a context that if you're not familiar with Ohm, it might not be really clear. So what I like to do is get- Invite consent. you to Ohm. <laughs> I like to get consent, right? right? And so it's my, like, I still feel, uh, Fuck it. I'm st I still feel turned on when I see women dressed a certain way in public that I don't know. And the first thing I do is breathe into stability and like be like, okay, it's not my job. It's not my, it's not, I don't have permission to allow my male gaze to either energetically or verbally intrude on this person. And I'm still, it's still okay for me to feel the way I feel about this. So there's a layer at which you can create connection that feels good without overstepping and then create consent for the comment. Well, here's so what I, I, what I would I like. tend to, I like would tend to have a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. The idea is that you can have a conversation that doesn't start there and create the dynamic tension and then the consent and even the desire for that feedback, that share to come up in a way that's natural and, and feels good as opposed to just like, hey, I like your miniskirt. Like, you know, here's what I say that there's part of the practice is to say, hey, I like your miniskirt and she erupt and just throw fire suddenly i'm in the oven full of blaze and me to chill with that like okay that's what happened with that and it's she's not wrong i'm not wrong i'm not going to say it again you know i don't keep pushing it but just stand and take it like there's part of what i like in this ohm community is the space opens up more and more for the difficult parts of our humanity, the uncomfortable parts of our humanity. And another example that comes to mind is um, someone in my family made bracelets for themselves. And one of them says, nice cock. And the other one says, titties. <laughs> and <laughs> that is so funny to me, but could be super triggering to someone else not the individual's problem who created that bracelet and is wearing them like that's 
their choice. You know, honestly, the VMAs were more triggering than that last night. That's right. I, I, I just heard <laughs> something about Madonna's butt. <laughs> That's all I've heard so far. It's been 20 years since we saw Madonna's butt, and now there's controversy once again. Yeah, exactly. Apparently, it was very uplifting, <laughs> uplifted. And there was debate about implants or some sort of harness aperture that lifted the cheeks up. You know, if Madonna appears at a video music award show and there isn't some kind of controversy the next day, it's a failure. Exactly. I say for someone in her 60s, thank God she's still relevant being talked about, you know, good for her, whatever she's doing. Yeah. And I saw um, when Twitch came out when we were deep in COVID, no, before COVID, because people were at concerts. Yeah, Twitch was out. And I saw some live concerts of her, you know, people with their Twitch things, periscoping or whatever the fuck they were doing. Anyway, it was really good. Like there was one piece she'd come out into the audience, like, you know, a circle thing. And it was acoustic. And it was super just like her just singing with a guitar. And I was like, damn. Yes, she's definitely a talented songwriter. One of the things that was great for me was to see this documentary that just came out about the very first years of her in New York. And so they interviewed her roommates and the first band she was in, and they were really honest about the way it all played out. And, you know, she wasn't in the documentary and you could tell that they were truth telling and they also still loved and cared for her. But it wasn't a whitewash, right? It was, it was, it told the whole story about the complications of her dynamic talent and leaving them kind of behind. At a certain point, she outgrew them. Yeah, she went hard. Yeah. She went and hard. she was fully like, you know, I was listening to the podcast we posted today um, where we were talking about how hard Prince worked and how that made his 20s kind of hardcore, right? right? right, right. Similar thing. Like there's this element of being, a hard working entertainment, you know, uh, performer where you kind of have to like play hardball if you want to play at a certain level. And, you know, that's just the context of, of, you know, the American music industry, the worldwide music industry in some levels, but, you know, I think it'd be great to own with Madonna. <laughs> You'd be able to do <laughs> Correct. Do a lot of things with Madonna. Do you think you'd be nervous? Um, that's a great question. Of course, I would hope not. But then I think there's an element of nervousness with almost anyone when it's a first time. So I would hope that the, what I've learned in home would be able to be present with Madonna. <laughs> You know, so when she says to me, Greg, do you mind if I drip this hot wax all over your body and get out these? I'd be like, OK, let's go there. Let's do this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, she does seem like a no nonsense. Mom. Yeah, exactly. This woman. Right. Activist. Yep. Yep. Um, Artist, performer. Yeah, she converted from Catholicism to Judaism, too. There was something in that for her. I don't know if she, I know she was studying the Kabbalah and really into the mysticism aspects of Judaism, but I don't know if she actually became Jewish. Hmm. I thought she converted, but I guess that's my assumption. Well, <clears throat> there's some who would say you'd have to convert to study it, but I don't know. Yeah. Like I had to convert to get bar mitzvahed, but my brother and sisters did not. Shifting sort of back to the VMAs a little. Yeah. Did you watch the whole thing? Yeah. It was really uncomfortable for me in certain ways because one, I'm old enough now that I don't know like 75% of who these artists are. And there's a kind of uh, stylistic preferences that I have from my own up about what I like in music that aren't met by these performers. And there's a kind of consistent visual presentation, which is what video music has done to music all along, really, 
right? But it's now it's it's like it's at its forty year zenith, right? And um, I was by the end of the show, I was overwhelmed. Like my nervous system had been hijacked, and it had been hijacked one because I thought the production was amazing. They used VR and, you know, mixed reality with the video, and then they had an incredible production light show, and they had, you know, uh, LED screens in the floors of the stage and in the walls behind, and that was used to great effect in a couple of instances and not really very well in, in others. Um, it's like rock and roll music and now you know i don't know what you call it it's not rock anymore it's not really pop it's like nouveau it's not even new, what i was about to say it's like it's still so sexually charged all these women and all these young men are just like so sexually charged and they're you know little naz super sexual and definitely, you know, male to male turn on. And like my girlfriend really dug that. <laughs> I was like, mm. but then I realized how that was great for her. And then I had all these other experiences related to how young women were dressed in the show and the way they were moving their bodies. And I was like, part of me was in disapproval of being 58 and looking at 20 somethings. And part of me was just like, absolutely triggered in a positive way like you know like oh, damn that's hot right and then then being like oh i'm not supposed to feel this way about that young woman oh and i think you are i think that's okay that's part of that animal thing like truly i think that's why um you know there's cheating and adultery and all sorts of the chaos with sexuality because there's this animalistic energy that is no boundaries, no rules. It just is like, let's fuck. I am turned like, on. I mean, if we were to kind of rank socially acceptable sexual attraction, old white guys and young 20 something girls is like low on the list of acceptable, isn't it? I don't think so. Look at Mick Jagger with his most recent child and the woman he's with she's like 20 something he's 70 and have you watched ted lasso here this is a spoiler I three quarters of the way through uh season one. Oh, then i won't say the spoiler but i will say that what the the scenario you just mentioned gets turned on its head in season two and it's a very well i think that's much more socially acceptable women older women and younger men i think rides easier in most people's minds i don't think that's, so. that's my conditioning i think that's just my like my limited viewpoint i think, like, so. I think yeah, so i think you're feeling guilty I have a about shame shadow around being attracted to younger women yeah yeah exactly you see this you 20, her first you you see this 20 year old in this fucking skimpy thing shaking that ass you're like uh i shouldn't feel this oh uh, run away run away <laughs> and she's just shaking that tail feather Oh yeah, look good. Look eatable. So it's it's not possible to escape our human nature. Exactly. So rather than escape, we have the opportunity to turn towards our conditioning and towards our natural desires and then redeem them from whatever shame shadows that have been a part of our conditioning. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that Ohm was able to teach me. Now I am not completely free yet, obviously. Be glad that you are free. Show me a man who's not. Um, I think what's beautiful with the own practice that I've learned is I can have this feeling of lust for someone who's very sexually like showing se her sexuality. And I can feel that and know that that doesn't mean there's no action attached to that. It's not for me to act upon. It's like, because I have my own values of my life that I want to live. Yeah. And a leer is an action. 
Absolutely. Yeah. But it's a t it's a television, Mark. You were watching television, okay? <laughs> you could have gone up and licked the TV and no one on the other side would have known. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I licking the TV was the farthest thing from my mind. Oh, come on. It was kind of there. <laughs> Oh, that's an interesting sound effect to bring into the sexual conversation. Well, yeah, the advertising, you know, that it was all one big ad, really, for these oh. new artists and stuff. Right, right. And then, you know, I was noticing the quality of the commercials was, you know, Super Bowl level. Hmm. Like they were, I could found it hard to turn away from some of the commercials. Hmm. Hey, speaking of football did you see what happened in miami with the cat no i didn't watch any football yesterday i didn't either but it was it quickly blew up on social media apparently this cat was got loose someone must have brought a cat to the game in miami and it got loose from like the third balcony you know like way up there and it's hanging on this canvas thing you know, and everyone's like, whoa, and then it finally, it lets go. It can't do it anymore. And the people below caught it in this towel they had spread out. And everyone Aww. cheers. And I guess they had it on the, the cam, you know, the big stadium. Like everyone kind of sort of forgot the game for this moment. Everyone's concentrated. <laughs> I on think that was deliberate. Like the person bringing their cat was like, okay, I'm going to be internet famous for a day. I don't know. Cause you don't ever see who's associated with the cat. It was all the cat painting and then the people who caught it. And someone beautifully um, put the soundtrack to um, the Lion King on it. So, and then because the person who caught it, they hold the cat up. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't like that. <laughs> That was funny. Ron effect. All right. Who's our producer? They're fired. Fuck. Sometimes going counter narrative is actually funnier than. That's true. Okay. Now we're back to prostitution. <laughs> Happy endings. Yeah. I'm just going to admit that um, some of my first ohms. I was so glad when that 15 minutes was up because I was just so like, do you ever get a cramp in your finger or your hand? Like you ever from the tension you were holding notice, holy shit, I'm like cramping up here. I had a different issue come up, but that one never did come up. Did that happen for you? I think it did once. Yeah. Yeah. I, ne I never got a cramp. <sighs> I got like the Parkinson's shake which can be fun apparently uh, that yeah that did happen to me yeah yeah it's usually when i i realize i'm holding my breath hmm. yeah breathe breathe in the air don't be afraid to care yeah, so to sort of finish out the one taste story, which is the organization Nicole de Don formed, they, this beautiful practice was then pimped out to create money, to create a, uh, an organization that at, at first, it seemed like a good idea because it was a great way to propagate the idea, create safe spaces, create training. And to do that, you need staff and you need to have a, you know, a real process. But over time, it began to become exploitive in a monetary way. Like there were but not for everyone. Like, I just want to clarify. Well, yeah. That. If you just, if you knew how to say no. Right. Right. Except but there were a lot, but re just remember now when you're pushing people's sexual buttons, you're there, they become very manipulatable. You're talking about some seriously intense triggers for people. So, Oh no, that's kind of like someone, you know, I mean, you weren't there, man. <laughs> no, but there's the whole thing of, you know, alcohol. Is it the people manufacturing the alcohol and advertising it? Is it their responsibility for the alcoholic? 
Yeah, I see your point. I see your point. And there were some really exploitive sales processes that were being carried out by One Taste. Seriously. Well, like sales I, is exploitive to it, you know, in a way. You are absolutely saying to someone, I have something you need, you want this. And like you've even struggled with it with your own business and kind of wondering like how far into this aspect of sales and marketing am I comfortable with is what you've asked yourself. Right. And, and it's partially because I have this reflection of what the one taste experience is like as a place I don't want to go. Yes. And then, you know, there's someone like Tony Robbins, who's at the peak of coaching game who marketing and sales is a huge part of what they're doing. For some reason, I don't find it exploitive. Well, if we could just break it all the way down to Madison Avenue principles, like go back all the way to the beginning. Hey, real quick. Century. Do you know Greg Ken? Yes. You know his song, Madison Avenue Man? Maybe. It's from the early days. I think it was the first or second album. Yeah. Great song. <laughs> okay. Check it out. Um, my point was that the the science of marketing became centered around people's pain points and subliminal manipulation around discomfort. Mm -hmm. Right. So we could see that like in the Playboy magazine era of the 50s and early 60s, it was like you have to be a certain kind of man if you're going to be a Playboy man. Right. And so anybody who wasn't was like trying to buy the cigar, trying to buy that liquor, trying to buy that tie, trying to buy that car, right? And we do that to women too, with all kinds of the cosmetics and the whole fashion industry. And like, so there's this inherent piece of our marketplace that uses the fear of uh, isolation and the fear of being um, <clears throat> pushed out of the collective and that forces sort of a sense of compliance around what we buy. Right. There's absolutely marketing is you don't have something and I have it and you need it and you can buy it from me. Exactly. Exactly. And this is a good time to break away to one of our sponsors. Please send a donation of $20 to the host at mopedoutlaws.com. That's the hosts plural at mopedoutlaws.com and your comic points will be up 20 percent thank you now back to our show i just want to say happy thanksgiving because i'm guessing that's when this is airing no we only have two episodes between buffer now wow really oh wait you know what there's probably some episodes that you haven't sent me yeah you're right Okay. There's three, I, I, at least two in my queue that I know of. And yeah, so this that, let's time. have a production meeting this week and sit down and, and just do that part. Figure All it right. out. We'll do Zoom and we'll go through and we'll get my recordings and all that. Okay. Oh my God. You know, I look forward to this. I was really looking forward to this. Right on. So was I. I was happy. I was stoked. Um. And uh, it was really great to see you so fired up this weekend when we got together. I was like, I'm, yeah, I had to witness you. And then that post, you know, you premiered something on your um, zero time thing that had never happened before. <laughs> and it was really like triggering. Like, who is she? What is she doing here? And so I'm asking you, who is that woman? My daughter. That's the Yunus Bodhi. Wow. I know she's, she is, she's a young woman now. Beautiful. She's yeah. not very talkative. No. Well, <laughs> she is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I love is her fashion sense is so blossomed. Like, and what's super cool is out of my three children, her musical tastes are closest aligned with mine. Like we'll hang out. I listened to some hardcore shit. In fact, she's going with me to see Ramstein, Ramstein next year. Yeah. Is that all of them now? Have we gone through all of them? No. How many do you have left? 
I'm not going to tell you. You just have to tune in next week and see if you hear any of the of any the, new. For those of you who can guess the new sound effects, you will get nothing. Yay! <laughs> Yeah, that was Bodie. Which so I hope cool. she doesn't mind. She's the one who created those bracelets that I referred to earlier. Well, she was anonymous up till a moment ago. Yep. I've outed her. But you know, God bless her. I think it's just I really enjoy being a parent who is alone for the ride and not doing my best not to steer their ship because it's they're the captain of their ship. Yeah, and you've already helped them build it and point it in the right direction and sew the sails and, you know, get get the bilge pump going and taught them how to navigate. Teach them the difference between water and land. <laughs> <laughs> right. Port and stern, green light, red light. <laughs> Isn't that like a kid's game? Yeah, it is. Like there, right. you, I think I even played that with Robin when she was little. You run, you like set up two lines and you let people. No, no, it. there's one line and someone's the traffic light and they turn with their back to the people and they say green light and people start running towards them. And then they whip around like, oh, they say red light and turn around. And if they see someone move, that person's out. Ah, see, that's fun. And the goal is to touch the person who's the traffic light. Got it. So there's a lot of like green light, red light. <laughs> you, know, <turn> around. <laughs> you can't turn around. And as you're saying it, you have to say it and turn and around. And then turn around. Yeah. yeah. But I remember as a kid, that line got real blurry. We're yeah. kids, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> green light, red light. <laughs> Ah, uh, so I have a funny penis. <laughs> <laughs> but it has stage fright, so it won't do stand up. I need those buttons. <laughs> that was a very quick joke, Mark. It, it's the funniest thing about me, or so I'm told. Funny looking. <laughs> How would you know? I heard it from Kathy. I called Ooh. her up one day. Hey, Kathy. <laughs> what do you think of Mark's penis? Oh, it's funny looking. <laughs> Was an awkward call. I would admit. <laughs> Oh, now how many do you have left? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Let's see. Um, one. For those of two, you listening, Mark is counting the buttons he has not used. Two. He's up to two. There's two left. Yep. Next There's week. There's one I may we'll... never use. Oops, I just used it. Oh, you recorded me coughing. <laughs> was that what that was? Nope. That's a, a re, that sounded like me coughing. The human experience. It's a universal joy. Yeah. Do you know what? Is it on the one that went live today where I accidentally start choking? <laughs> You're like, are you okay? I've only made it about halfway through. I don't okay. think so. Either, well, it must not have been last week's because you would have heard that. Man, I really did not want to sit down at the desk last night and get everything scheduled and programmed. I was like, oh, I was like, oh, maybe I could wake up real early and do it. I was like, fuck that. You know, that's what I'm so glad you did. Thank you so much for welcome. that. Welcome. And I think we should actually set up um, a digital payment system for us, the hosts at mopedoutlaws.com. And or at the hosts at Moped Atlas or something like that on Venmo. So people can send money and we can give that money to charity. To uh, Cowboy Outlaws. I mean, the uh, um, Compton Cowboys. Count Compton Cowboys, yeah. That's our charity of choice right now. And I know you have others and I appreciate that. There is a plethora of charities to support. There's a uh, lot of work to be done, people. Yes. So 
Get out and our there. about page, you can see a link to the Compton Cowboys, and they really are doing wonderful work. There's some great articles about them. I think there's even a documentary about them, a book. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a reasonably good day, but this was it. I, we peaked early today, I think. All right, cool. I, I'm going to revamp a bunch of stuff. I'm cleaning out my office and getting rid of I'm Marie Kondoing. All right. I don't know who Marie Kondo is. She wrote a book um, that took off about, you know, getting rid of stuff you don't need. And if it doesn't bring you joy, then get rid of it. Nice. It doesn't mean you have to throw it away. You can give it to, you know, goodwill, goodwill or whatever. Right, right. But like if it's, it, there's, we just hang on to so much stuff and it weighs yeah. us down spiritually. Yeah. There's a, a friend up in Nevada City and she had a thing. If, there was something you haven't really messed with for three months. It's just been sitting there. Bounce it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it looks like I better get rid of all my guitars. No, I'm just kidding. Yep. Especially the White Falcon. The infamous no. White Falcon. No. It's got to go. No. <laughs>